I want to first introduce our three panelists, and I'll begin with longtime friend, uh, artivist, artivista, Marta Gonzalez, co-founder and lead singer of the Grammy award-winning Quetzal. She's a Chicana artivista, feminist, music theorist, and associate professor in Chicana, Chicano, Latina, Latina studies at Scripps Claremont Colleges. Arturo O'Farrell, or as I like to say, O'Farril, multi-Grammy winning composer, jazz pianist, and band leader, founder of the New York City-based Afro-Latin Jazz Alliance, and professor of music at UCLA. And there's a connection to someone I'm going to mention a little bit later, because this man also funds UCLA Department of Music. His Fandango at the Wall project was recorded at the border in Tijuana in 2000. In 2018, and um, just a little plug for this project. If you don't have it, I must say it's one record to have. And if you haven't seen the, the documentary, I haven't seen it yet, but it's another one to watch. And there's a book that, that also goes along with that. So finally, Jorge Castillo, uh, a new friend, founder and director of the Fandango Fronterizo. A celebration of music and dance taking place in late May at the border fence in Tijuana and San Diego. Jorge is also the leader of the cross-border Son Jarocho Ensemble Radio Guacamaya. Pleased to welcome all of you to this uh, special panel discussion. And I'll begin by um, talking a bit about border and music. The music of the border. And... And I'm going to talk about both sides of the border. Because back in the 1930s, um, some of you may or may not know, there was a massive signal coming out of the borderline between Ciudad Acuña and Del Rio in the northern state of Coahuila in Mexico. That, that's where the antenna was based. 400,000 watts of power beaming across North America and, of course, Mexico. And that... Um, border, as it was called, the X radio. Um, according to country music historian Charles Wolfe, the Carter family gained their largest audience through border radio stations. Yeah, perhaps the greatest radio star of the, of the time um, later was Wolfman Jack, who introduced countless figures of music, R&B, blues, jazz, the latest Wolfman Jack is the man where he was broadcasting from the border, beaming across North America because radio stations, of course, weren't allowed to have that much power. But this was a special radio station that the government of Mexico allowed this uh, entrepreneur who was from the Midwest and wanted to make a bunch of money, and he did. <laughs> but many artists became popular because of that radio station that beamed across North America. And I thought of the Carter family because it's one of the quintessential American uh, ensembles. Now, Tejano music emerged in South Texas in the late 1920s and early 30s when Tejano musicians such as Narciso Martinez and Santiago Jimenez started to blend Mexican music with polkas, with German music, with Eastern and Western European uh, musical traditions from German immigrants that came there, and it all happened in that border region. Of course, later, that music went across Mexico, and you have the explosion of the accordion, and of course, the beer, the beer culture as well, with musicians like Los Alegres de Teran, and so on, that took over the airwaves back in the day. In the 1950s, one of the major jazz figures of all time, none other, Charles Mingus, composed Tijuana Moods. Yeah, he spent time there and he saw it and he experienced it. And it's considered one of his most important works. There was, by the way, a panel discussion right here at, uh, well, UCSD last year with um, Ashley Khan talking about that particular recording with some special guests, musicians who had played with Charles Mingus. In the 1950s, both Mexican and African-American music influenced the work of none other than, in my opinion, the first rock and Espanol band <laughs> created in San Benito, near the border of Reynosa in Texas, with, of course, none other than Freddie Fender. His band was called Eddie and Con Los Shades, and he created the first rock and Espanol back in the day. 
the result of the border culture that he grew up with. Of course, we all know the story of Mr. Carlos Santana, who came from Autlán, Jalisco, his family established in Tijuana. Of course, later we all know that he moved to San Francisco, but he cut his teeth listening to blues, playing the blues in TJ. In fact, one of his bands was called, was called the TJs in the 1950s, long before he was the Santana that we know. In 1962, which happens to be the year that I was born, a young trumpet player, Jewish trumpet player from East LA, would be inspired by a brass band he saw at a ball fight in Tijuana. Yeah, at a Corrida de Toros, Mr. Herb Albert returned to Los Angeles and he created his own sound. And that first single was called The Lonely Ball. <laughs> And of course, to release a single called The Lonely Bowl, he had to create a record label because he didn't have one. Well, he and his partner, Jerry Moss, created the label A&M Records. Alpert and Moss. Herb Alpert, the man who now supports UCLA's Department of Music that I mentioned earlier, uh, that where Arturo works. So um, what happened, in the words of my colleague and friend, Josh Kuhn, what happened was that A&M Records, one of the most influential musical empires of the 20th century, was born in a Tijuana bowl ring. <laughs> there you go for border stories. And just to kind of bring it all home, a few months ago, I, I asked people on, on social media to name a band or musician whose work is improbable or unlikely without the U.S.-Mexico border. Oh my gosh. You should have seen all the list of people that started being named. I'll just name a few. Los Tigres del Norte, Los Lobos, Flaco Jiménez, Texas Tornadoes, Ramon Ayala, Rigo Tobar, Lalo Guerrero, Julieta Venegas, Norte Collective, Calexico, Linda Ronsdat, and so on. Juan Gabriel was raised in Juarez, and he grew up and his, he was nourished and nurtured by the music of the border. And maybe later on, Marta can talk about a song called Amor Eterno and her connection to that uh, after the shooting right in El Paso, where I think Marta were invited to, to perform. But I'd like to first begin by asking all of you right now, maybe we'll start with Marta first. Um, what, what, what do you think are the, um, the, the, you know, the, the, what is the meaning of, of, you know, do you see yourself as a sort of, uh, you know, musician that works in the border that, that sort of, works with the, the, the notion of working in, in that border, the Mexico, the U.S., that, that line? Yeah. Thank you, Beto, first of all, for that great um, quick synopsis that's difficult to do. Um, I just want to say you forgot Lidia Mendoza. Lidia Mendoza traveled in and around the border. Y ella, she's the first Chicana recording artist. Um, but... but um, but everything else you covered, I, I don't blame you. Este, but it's amazing. I really appreciate that, that um, convergence. You know, I, I think that as musicians, we, are, um, we have a responsibility to document um, our communities, right? And uh, one of the first people that I ever heard really articulate um, the border in a way that I that just clicked for me was a scholar named Gloria Anzaldúa. And she talked about the border as an unnatural site, number one, um, as, uh, and now we know that it is not only unnatural, but it's militarized, right? She talked about it as, uh, quote, una herida abierta, right, um, in the land. Um, and the border, um, in a lot of ways, in academia and in social, in media, in, more generally, the border has been documented as a place of violence and death, right? So as musicians, we, of course, uh, respond to that, and we, we like to document um, people's stories, their, their trials and tribulations, right? And as Quetzal, as a member of Quetzal, we've done that a lot, right? We've talked about people's, not just the death and the violence, but also about the resilience that exists at the border, so that it's everything from celebration to, to uh, stories of migration, right, uh, of triumph, right? But also that the border in and of itself as that dual place, that in-between space, that what they call, a lot of Chicana feminists call the third space, 
is exists in bodies as well, right? In ourselves, in other parts. So you don't have to live really close to the border to know what border culture is, right? And as Chicanos living in the U.S. and thriving in the U.S., any part of the U.S., right? Living, uh, resisting, thriving, uh, challenging U.S. dominant paradigms, you know, white supremacy, like all of these things, I think that we carry the border culture in us, right? We understand the duality, the code switching, the ways in which we exist right in the middle and the way in which we, we uh, navigate these, all of these different worlds. That is being um, uh, inhabiting the border or the border inhabiting um, your body in that way. And so I'll say that much for now. Well, I want us to see um, at least some of, of a song, a little bit of a song that you wrote uh, with your band Quetzal called Pillow People because you raise all of these things you talk about are very, you know, poignantly brought up in this particular song, which is, I, th I must say, one of the most touching songs you've ever written um, because it talks about people. It talks about the humanity that comes across the border. So if we could see this video now called Pillow People, by Quetzal. It's from your last recording, which I think is called The Eternal Get Down, right? Did yes. Did I get it right? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, and that's, it's on that Smithsonian. And you have another one coming up, uh, coming out in sometime yeah. in the late summer. And I have already listened to it today, and it's, oh, 
Fabulous. Thanks. Fabulous. Yes. Thank you, Beto. Thank yeah, you. And there's a song, actually, an homage to Fandango Fronterizo, which we can't play today, but um, <laughs> just so you know. Um, next, I want to talk with um, Arturo. Arturo, you were born in uh, Mexico City. This is uh, quite special. You have a very spiritual connection to Mexico. Uh, when, you were, uh, when you were little, your, your parents, and I must say, you are the son of none other than one of the giants of Afro-Cuban music, the, uh, the amazing, the fantastic uh, Chico O'Farri, um, who took, you know, who moved to Mexico after having lived in the U.S., I guess, Cuba, the U.S., Mexico. And then when you were five or six, if I got it correctly, you, your family moved uh, to, to New York. Uh, your mother is Mexican. Uh, tell us about the relationship that you've had with Mexico since. Briefly, I, um, <laughs> it's a long story. It's a long story. So I'll begin by, as you were telling the story of border music making, I thought about my mother, who at the age of 12 was a singer, Guadalupe Valero, who was uh, singing in Texas and California and crossing the border because she was a very gifted singer. And my relationship with Mexico is very spiritual. I am identified with Afro-Latino, Afro-Cuban music. But in point of fact, I feel spiritually Mexican. I relate in a way to the rhythms of Mexico more than I do to a lot of my other heritage. And indeed, my father, long story, I'll make it quick. I think he was caught smoking jazz cigarettes in Los Angeles and he had to beat a hasty retreat. <laughs> so he went back to Mexico. That's the story that I heard. I think he was secretly seeking my mother's uh, hand in marriage, so he had to go, of course, to the grandfather. But this whole idea of borders, and you know, my first real experience with the border wasn't at a fence with chicken wire and uh, dogs and people with machine guns. My first experience with the border was as a five-year-old Mexican little boy uh, landing at John F. Kennedy Airport in uh, New York City, and that was the beginning of a lifetime as a musician. I've gone through border experiences like you wouldn't believe. From I've crossed from West Berlin into East Berlin, I've wandered into Cuba a dozen times, South Korea, China. And every time I go through a border experience, my heart rushes a little. Because I know there are people who can say, no, you're not allowed to enter. You're not allowed to be a part of this incredible adventure of these beautiful people that you want to perform for. And uh, I mean, I've had some, I was, this is a true story. I had, a, I was performing with Carla Blay and one of her pieces featured a starter's pistol and the librarian left it in the music bag and I'm crossing from West Berlin into East Berlin <laughs> and they, the, the guards find this thing and for the next three years, everywhere I went, Interpol was waiting. But I, I will tell you, what amazing, amazing border story I hope I can. Um, I am very outspoken politically. I say a lot of uh, very revolutionary things in my interviews, in my posts, in my, in my music. And so I keep a low profile when I uh, go through borders. I got, you know, the global, uh, whatever it is, global traveler card, so I don't have to deal with this. And I'm walking through uh, on my fifth voyage back from Cuba in one year, and I get through uh, the uh, customs guy, and I walk by real carefully, give him the receipt, just try and sneak on by, and all of a sudden he goes, he looks at the receipt, he looks at me, and he goes, hello, hold on, come with me. And this guy literally takes me to a corner of the room and he motions a bunch of other custom guards and they all circle me. And he's looking at me, he's looking at the receipt. He's looking at them. They start talking. I'm thinking, that's it. And all of a sudden he says, this guy is an American hero. <laughs> 
and he start. They all start going, "Man, we love your music. We've been fans for so many years." And I'm looking at the guy. I'm going, "Man, you just gave me a heart attack." But the truth of the matter is, the border politics are so pregnant with a history of revolting violence and hatred and fear and racism. And that's just part of the thing that we have to deal with in Tijuana and, and in Texas. And that's just, an, it's, an, it's, it's a terrible thing. And so for me as a Mexican, I feel very strongly that uh, that border is an aberration, an insult, a, a frailty of humanity, a folly, a vanity, and something that does neither protect anyone and actually it offends the spirit of humanity. Thank you, Arturo. Um, Jorge, you are, unlike all of us, you are actually from the border region. Uh, you were born in uh, El Paso, right? Correct. Uh, I got that right. And your family is from the border region, from Juarez, El Paso. And you moved some years ago to San Diego, and then the recession hit, and you decided to, by some special, I don't know, magic or reason, you decided to move to Tijuana, where you're now speaking to us from. Um, tell us briefly, if you would, um, how that happened, and also, because originally people, I, I understood that the Fandango Fronterizo was born in TJ, in Tijuana, by folks on the other side. But as it turns out, no, I talked to you and you said, well, it really was sort of a, you know, it, it was born in San Diego by soneros in San Diego. And then, you know, you decided to make that um, binational thing. So tell us how that happened briefly. Could, I know it's a long story, but I want you to kind of Tell us, we you know, within three or four minutes, uh, that story. Absolutely. Um, do you want me to start in El Paso or uh, going to... San well, I can tell you real quick. Um, uh, yes, I was born in El Paso, but then I was raised in, in Juarez. So all my, my educational years, elementary, all the way through high school, I was in Juarez. And then eventually I moved to El Paso to go to university in UTEP. Um, I went to music school and um, I was um, always traveling back and forth since I was a kid. So for me, the border, it was something so normal. I mean, uh, everything was uh, either Juarez, El Paso. Nobody, nobody cared if he was in El Paso or Juarez. It was so binational. So in your mind, uh, there was no border. There was only El Paso and Juarez, El Paso and Juarez. When he, there was not so much, uh, I used to cross my cousins in cars when say, hey, just say you're American and they'll let you go. So we'll say American and my cousins will go, American, American, and they'll, they'll be happy to cross the border and spend some time in El Paso. There was nothing like it is now that you have to bring a passport and everything like that. So we used to do that all the time and, and uh, so raising, I mean, growing at the border, uh, it's always been natural to me. So when I came to San Diego after um, my years in UTEP, I came to San Diego and then I started uh, working as a librarian in San Diego at the Chula Vista Public Library, where I spent uh, my career as a librarian. And um, then... Uh, in about 2006, I, I was invited to a, a Fandango in San Diego. And um, I never heard of the word Fandango in, in these uh, terms. Uh, I, was, uh, I was related to a Fandango always with the Spanish celebration and from music from Spain and all that, but I never heard it from Veracruz. So I, I heard music from Veracruz and I always was involved with the uh, classical music, uh, Latin American music, and, and Trova Cubana, Trova, Nueva Trova, which was one during my years in, in, in university, I was involved with all that. But um, but never heard of the Fandango and, this, and, and never played Son Jarocho either, never played a Jarana. So I was invited to this event in San Diego. So I was really shocked to go to, to a friend's house um, um, 
and and uh, he invited me to go to this uh, celebration. It was actually his birthday. Uh, uh, you, a lot of you guys know him as Eduardo Garcia. He had this celebration at his house, and I think he was the only Latino singing. Uh, everybody else was uh, Anglo. And they were singing, or bilingual teachers, and and they were all singing and and trying to, I mean, playing the harana real well and dancing really well, but um, he was pretty much the only one singing real well, and and because it, the, all the lyrics were in Spanish, and I didn't know, I had no idea how to sing son jarocho because I had never heard it before, so I was able to follow with the harana they let me borrow. So little by little, we got to know people in Tijuana. Um, in 2007, I became more involved with the uh, music and the fandangos in, in San Diego. And then um, we met people from Tijuana that they were starting to do fandangos as well. And um, Carlos Rosario and, and um, Horacio, Mariche, Giovanni, Adriana, a bunch of people were organizing themselves and, and, and doing fandangos at, in Tijuana. So we started crossing the border and, and, and I mean, to, to go to Fandangos in Tijuana or go to Fandangos in San Diego. But unfortunately, not too many people could cross the border to San Diego because of the visas and the documents and all that. So um, it's, um, one time I was, um, uh, I was invited to the playas de Tijuana, and that's when this idea of the Fandango Fronterizo just popped out because I saw the fans. I never been to that place before, and right there we decided to do the fandango. I, I I said, well, let's do a fandango here. So we started experimenting and brainstorming with different people. So, but we were in San Diego, so we were the ones that pushed it from San Diego, and we invited the people in Tijuana, and they say, yeah, yeah, let's do it, let's do it. So we end up doing it, and during my during the first five fandangos, I was still in San Diego, so I will come to San Diego and stay on the on the American side. Then after I moved to Tijuana, now I spend every year in Tijuana because it's a lot easier. You don't have to walk all the way to... And, and uh, not only that, because logistically it's much easier because I live very close and, and, and we have uh, people coming from Mexico and we like to host them and, and, you know, try to tell them or help them move around. So... It's a lot easier for me to be in, in, in Tijuana. So one one day I was um, uh, one of the I, I I was always going to San Diego. Uh, I mean to Tijuana to the Fandango and then go back to San Diego. But one time uh, when I decided to to during you know during 2009 2010 when we had the the real estate crisis in in the whole U.S. and also some parts of Mexico, I decided to sell my house and and I was going to live in San Diego and I almost had a house already signed and, and, and um, to ready to move in. And then one Saturday they invited me. In fact, I don't forget this because it was exactly when Patricio Hidalgo had had a, a surgery because he almost died. He had a, a I can't, a, a appendicitis, I think. He had appendicitis, and he almost died, so we did a fandango to raise some funds to send them to him. So I came to this fandango in Tijuana, in Playas, but it was not at the border. It was at a Casa de Cultura. Uh, Arturo, you probably remember that Casa de Cultura where we did that uh, recording and, and that concert. So we, we had that fandango there, and then I drove around, and I saw this beautiful house, and I said, like, Hey, this is not bad. This is this town is beautiful. I've never been to this area. So then I I made a phone call. I made a couple of phone calls, and and in a, in a month, in less than a month, I was living in that house already. So it was a great experience for me uh, to that. So so all this has happened to me. Um, I can close this story with uh, saying that uh, Fandango and Son Jarocho has influenced my life so much that I can say it, it changed my life. And I can pretty much talk before Son Jarocho and life after Son Jarocho in 2007. <laughs> so it's really, it, it has become a, a form of life for us, for a lot of us, for a lot of us. That's the power of music. And 
And I want us to see uh, a video of the Fandango Fronterizo and what it's about for those of you who are watching this now and saying, what is that? If you don't know what the Fandango Fronterizo is, let's see um, a little bit of a little documentary, I guess, of the Fandango Fronterizo right now. My name is Cameron Quevedo. I'm a filmmaker and an ethnomusicologist. Uh, I'm actually, I was born here in San Diego, but I'm now based in Austin, Texas. The Fandango Fronterizo is an opportunity to reach out to folks across the border. It's an opportunity to really kind of reclaim space and take back the border. Uh, fill it with culture, fill it with music, fill it with life, and uh, which is very important, which is very necessary, especially today. This is, uh, this is Friendship Park. And this is where we have uh, the Fandango Fronterizo every year. It's a gathering of musicians on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border fence. Ah, yo soy Carolina Martinez y soy parte del comité organizador del Fandango Fronterizo. Es la oportunidad de poder celebrar un lugar que uh, causa mucho dolor para las comunidades emigrantes y transformarlo en una fiesta. Es una forma de resistencia también. Uh, pero celebrando y haciendo música es toda una contradicción. My name is Maya Jupiter, I'm a hip-hop artist. Logically, I know that we're close to Mexico, but you never think about that you can reach out and touch it. My name is uh, Israel Aranda, I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I mean, one day this wall is going to fall. One day this wall is, we're not going to have this wall. Like, people were singing, you know, and some of the verses, this is a scar on our mother. This is heartening. But at the same time, we hold our home. Uh, so my name is uh, Anna Tiju. I'm a Chilean rapper. And my name is Shadia Mansour. I'm a Palestinian. Um, I'm a rapper also and a singer. I'm very familiar with checkpoints and what they call security fences. What brings me here really is just to, uh, is, is to be in solidarity, show my solidarity, and also learn more about um, the situation here. I think it's very important like to be here and and share this experience. So it's important to think in an internationalist way. I think this is a very crucial moment where we got to think together. Bueno, yo me llamo Alberto Alor Alemán y vengo de Chinameca, Veracruz, que es un pueblo en el sur del estado de Veracruz, en el país de México, ¿no? en donde se toca la música de jarana o la música de cuerda. I think for a lot of people, music is a really wonderful entry or a gateway, uh, a, a door kind of into culture, into sharing spaces. It's been a way to kind of reconnect to my roots. Uh, it's been a way to meet other people, to meet like-minded folks. Marta Gonzalez, I want to go back to you now uh, before, before I actually wanted to ask Arturo about how he learned of the Fandango, but I wanted to ask you, you've been to the Fandango Fronterizo, a few times. Many times. But not only that, you have gone to Veracruz several times. In fact, uh, you did a fellowship uh, in my hometown of Jalapa, yeah. Veracruz. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you lived there and you experienced the music, the culture, the tradition, the community. As, uh, as your partner Quetzal likes to say, the convivencia. Um, Tell us about that experience. That is uh, an experience that you've brought, in a sense, to your community, to East LA, to, 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 to create what you call artivismo. Yes. Well, actually, uh, so even before I, I did a Fulbright Fellowship, uh, which is a transnational fellowship uh, um, in uh, 2008 and uh, 2007 into 2008. But before then, we'd had a longstanding relationship with this transnational dialogue of, uh, of soneros and fandangueros, um, which is we loosely called El Nuevo Movimiento Jaranero. Now people don't use that very much, but at the beginning, this is precisely what it was called. So in 1998, 
um, starting 1998 and into the present, we've been making trips back and forth, as well as a very grassroots community here in Los Angeles, in Santana, in San Diego, and now all over the United States has been very active in, in cultivating these relationships in different parts of Veracruz and, uh, and Mexico City as well. So this transnational sort of dialogue of soneros and the fandango as this ritual, the fandango as a ritual, I just want to make this very clear. The fandango is one thing, which is el ritual, the ritual that gives birth to this convivencia, right? And the sound that erupts from this convivencia, this uh, ritual practice called the fandango, is comes the son jarocho, right? So this beautiful sound that has um, a millennia, hundreds of years of influence from African influences and rhythms to Spanish and Andalusian influences um, to, of course, indigenous um, in the area, Popolucas and the area in which the Vera, Veracruz is, is centered in Oaxaca, parts of Oaxaca as well. That whole area gives birth to the Son Jarocho, right? And so we as Chicanos have always had an affinity, as you well know, Beto, with the Son Jarocho for many years. So, for example, it wouldn't, um, Richie Valens wouldn't have had such a hit like La Bamba if it wasn't for the Son Jarocho and how, how um, quick it was to lend itself to the rock and roll rhythm, right? That we now all know La Bamba, right? So La Bamba is one son out of many sones you can possibly hear during this fandango ritual, right? So the fandango in and of itself is what, um, of course, we love the son jarocho, the sound, the genre, right? But I think that for us, our generation of Chicanos and Latinos and Mexicanos here in the U.S. really gravitated more towards the ritual practice of the fandango. And this democratization is uh, music, as Arturo mentioned to us earlier in our conversations, um, the way in which it lent itself to people that don't necessarily have to be musicians to participate and to be part of this community practice of convivencia that from the convivencia relationships are born, dialogue that you couldn't imagine, analysis, cultural and spiritual, political analysis. And uh, the Fandango Fronterizo is the, is the fruits of those kinds of dialogues, right? Where folks are, are, are alive, feel alive and, 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 um, Get, um, hold relationships in this fandango practice and then one day the border's right there right Jorge just said it earlier and suddenly they're like wait a minute we can have a fandango at the border right so suddenly the fandango fronterizo becomes the most political um, outward manifestation of this fandango but fandangos are taking place everywhere all over the U.S. right now it thrives in our communities because I think that we've been isolated from each other, right? <laughs> Talk about the isolation now, right? But, yeah. but really, like, we've been isolated from each other. We begin to realize that music is something that we should all do and that we can all do, that we can do in community, that uh, these beautiful things happen as a result, right? And so for us, that's what really drew us to Mexico. That's what really drew us more to sort of experience this dialogue um, before heading over to do this work in, as in the Fulbright in 2007 and 2008, um, we had spent years, you know, going back and forth. We would raise money here in the U.S. We would bring over Gilberto Gutierrez, who is one of the, pro the major proliferators, early proliferators of this fandango practice, um, the fandango as a ritual practice, not just the son jarocho. So he wasn't just about teaching Look at this is how you strum. This is how you. This is how you sing. This is how you dance. He taught you that, but most importantly, he thought taught you the ethics and the and the moral value of getting together as community. So the fandango is is I I would say that the most important aspect of this entire thing is the fandango, and what that fund has given to our communities and to communities in Mexico and how we've connected and made something bigger of it and this dialogue continues and has evolved in all of these different ways which is beautiful and i hope it continues thank you marta about four years ago um arturo you were given or shown an article in the new york times by your friend kabir sigal um who said hey did you see this look at this article and that article was sort of like the the spark that said to you I got to do something about this. Tell us the story of how you ended up creating this Fandango at the Wall, this recording with inviting musicians from all over the world 
and of course meeting Jorge Castillo uh, and, and this the, the concept behind Fandango at the Wall and then after that we'll watch uh, your a video, a clip, a little clip of the documentary. I'm happy to do that. I just want to say what Marta said is so beautiful because I think I'm I, I'm kind of dealing with this in my life. I grew up in New York. I came from Cuba and Mexico. I grew up a classically trained pianist with predilection for jazz. And then that's an elite world of elite structures and elite specializations. And what I've learned and the beautiful thing that Jorge and Fandango and Marta and Son Jarocha have taught me is that that's a cultural construct. These structures of elitism are ways to control conduits of power and wealth and influence. And the thing that I keep going back to in my life is that music is not meant to be used to divide. Music is not meant that to be a wall. It's not meant to be a border. And it's there's something to me that's so alien about the idea that these structures of elitism are paint music as a special skill and artists should be venerated. And I think that's nonsense. I think that people should all pick up instruments and should all learn how to dance and should all be free without fear to express their soul, their Pueblo soul. And it goes back to the idea that the way we have allocated power and wealth in the world and especially in the United States is along very narrow borders. A very select few get to control what 99% of us have to deal with. And I think that's a huge error, a tactical error in the way most of the rest of the world lives. Most of the rest of the world lives in communities and villages. Most of the rest of the world celebrates the rituals of death, life, divorce, remarriage, in groups as human beings of equal value. And this is why San Jarocho and Fandango are more important now than ever. And um, I don't know if it was, maybe it was Kabir. I think I, me and Kabir discovered the article because uh, Karen Hopkins actually was uh, the board member that sent me this article. And um, I read about Jorge. And... Um, I thought it was some of the most simple, elegant activism I've ever heard in my life. The idea, the very gall of thinking that notes could travel through fencing. The very idea that notes and singing and dancing could fly over like a bird physical barriers with chicken wire and guns and dogs. I thought that was actually the most incredibly powerful thing I ever heard and I thank God that Kabir, my record producer and friend for many years saw the poetry in that and we were able to take uh, this idea of destroying physical matter with notes and community in Pueblo and allowed me to go with Kabir to meet uh, Jorge and Patricio and Ramon and all these incredible musicians. So at first, uh, the idea was to just reach out to, uh, to Jorge and Kabir found Jorge and Jorge was generous enough to allow us to approach very humbly the committee that organizes the Fandango and ask for permission ask for permission not to come and take over the thing but just to be there and celebrate and uh we found ourselves in veracruz and we found ourselves in falapa we found ourselves uh learning about the haranas and spending time being humbled humbled by the great musicians and the incredible weapon of truth and valor that they carry and so somehow uh, again, uh, through the auspices of Kabir and the Afro-Latin Jazz Alliance and the grace and wonder of Jorge and these amazing artists, we were allowed to go to the Fandango Fronterizo and invite a lot of friends to stand alongside uh, these great musicians and celebrate. Because at the end of the day, um, what Fandango is, 
it's a celebration of our commonness. I mean, that sounds weird, but it's a celebration of the things that hold us together across walls in North and South Korea, in Palestine, across walls in Guantanamo. Across walls, we had the privilege of bringing Jorge uh, and Wendy and Tacho to Cuba, to the Casa de las Americas, and celebrate uh, Son Jarocho music with Changui. <laughs> we had the great Coto and uh, beatboxers and rap artists and gospel singers and Cuban jazz and mambo and you know, that's what Son Jarocho is. That's what I was introduced to that day through that article, the idea that this elitism is a bigger wall than some of us care to admit. And that in actuality, the music of Son Jarocho is art of the highest possible nature. Um, in your project, before we, we, we see um, a clip from the documentary or the trailer, you invited um, a Persian musician, Saba Motalebi, and you invited Rahim al Haj, who is an Iraqi musician. Why, why did you decide, why did you feel that that was important to also... I'm going to get in trouble here, and I'm going to get you all in trouble. But it was around the time that when we first kind of thought of this was around the time of the presidential uh, campaign and nominations and soon thereafter the election of the current administration. And there was a list of countries and people who this president found offensive. Um, and, and so I wanted to have those people represent as long as well as our Mexican brethren who were also being uh, ferociously insulted from the very steps of the Trump building at the beginning of that campaign. And so I, I, you know, I didn't believe in saying outwardly openly that this is a political moment, but I did want to make a statement about the humanity and the issues that plague uh, the Middle East and the walls and borders and the situations that... So I originally actually wanted... I wanted somebody from each of the seven banned countries to join us at the, at the wall, at the border. And uh, Saba and uh, Rahim are incredible musicians. And we brought uh, musicians from all over the world. We brought uh, MacArthur fellow Regina Carter, a Golden Globe nominee and Grammy winner Antonio Sanchez, the Afro-Latin Jazz Orchestra, uh, the Villalobos brothers. We brought, and, and the beautiful thing is that we brought them to Fandango Fronterizo to learn, to see love in action. And not one of us for the rest of our lives will walk away without being schooled in love and community in Pueblo. Let's see uh, uh, the trailer of the documentary um, that, uh, that was produced, uh, that directed by... Varda Barkar, executive producer, my dear friend and mentor, Kabir Sagal. Let's see a clip of that, uh, of that documentary. This all started when I read about a wizard who was changing physical matter itself with the music of Fandango. Que viva Mexico! Como la 
he gathered his friends at the border to sing, perform, and dance. And that wall, built to divide us, was transformed into something that unites us. Tarima y tumba y cajón, de donde viene tu encanto. Tarima, tumba y cajón, de donde viene tu encanto. Me viene del corazón, del monte sereno y santo. Me viene del corazón, del monte sereno y santo. I fell in love with this idea of people coming together, using that primal connection of music and culture to destroy barriers and remove borders. Tarima, tumba y cajón, de donde viene tu encanto. Tarima, tumba y cajón, de donde viene tu encanto. Me viene del corazón, del monte sereno. People have been gathered from every corner of the earth. People who have never met to these studios, to this border, for this cause. This is not just a story, but it's also a fight for survival. There's a question uh, about uh, the roots, how African music is present in Son Jarocho and Marta, could you address that and, and how is it manifested? I mean, we, we always talk about the La Tercera Raiz in Mexico, it's, it's called and we always more, say... More recently now, yeah, right? More but recently, not before. But, <laughs> and we've always known, I mean, I, I, okay. I, I grew up knowing that we did have African presence in, in Veracruz because that's, that's where I grew up. Oh, right. But it's always been denied. Until recently, there's more of an acknowledgement, uh, even right. official, uh, that there is an African presence. How does it manifest in the actual music of Son Jarocho? Well, the, the, uh, there are so many ways, right? Uh, socially, I think that um, the value of the call and response is really important, right? I mean, m musically, of course, sonically, it's all there. There's a lot of uh, contrapuntal rhythms. There's 6-8 uh, um, and 4-4 and 3-against-2, and, four, four and, and like it's all going on at once. And it depends on what instrument you're listening to, if it's a zapateado or if it's the... Uh, if it's the actual, uh, if it's the Leona or the Jarana, the rhythms that are coming out of the Jarana, they're all having dialogue, right? It's all dialectic. It's not, I want to make one thing very clear is that it's not, um, I think it's really important that we think about the Fandango as something that everybody can come to and participate in. And there are elements of that that I do believe. But I, I have to make sure that it doesn't turn into a what I call a Venice, um, a Venice um, beach sort of drum circle where, the nuances of the sones are lost. In the fandango, there is a very definitive, uh, every son has its rhythm, every son has its cadencia, every son has a protocol, the way you come on and off the tarima, there's all of these things that cannot be lost, otherwise it's not really a fandango, right? Um, I think that's really important. And in fandango, there are so multiple voices, right? Um, there's the call and response is very important. And the beauty of the fandango at the border was that there are people on the Tijuana side giving the call or the response, right? And there are people on the on the San Diego side 
giving the call and response, right? There's a protocol that has to be sort of followed. And that is the beauty of what's happening, right? It takes years, of course, to under really understand the fandango, the ethics around it and what's going on, but also to sort of stand back and realize, you know, and then, of course, there's um, in fandango, that doesn't mean that there's not high, really high levels of musicianships, as you well know, Ramon, Patricio, the Utreras, like um, all those families, um, but Los Vega, all the families that, of course, also come with their skill sets that are extremely, that, that offer up their, their, their um, skill sets, right? But then there's also all the other people that gather and have up to now, to 10 years, have, have seen this ritual practice as something that's both political and ritualized, of course, and almost sacred, right, at this border, where for a mere second, it's not that we're seeing over the border or even through, of course, sound travels, but for a second there, and if we do it right, the border is willed out of existence for those two hours. It's willed out of existence, right? And that's something that I think is really powerful. And the ritual practice of the call and response, the polyrhythms that go on, that the African presence that is giving us that, right? That is really um, getting that going, right? That is really allowing for that. Mexico was the first slave port, right? Mil thousands of millions and mil I would say millions of, of slaves were brought in. All of these um, ancestors are suddenly speaking now at the border, right? These influences that I was talking about earlier. And, and then, of course, and I, I just want to distinguish that performance is one thing. Fandango is something else. And I think that we for Fandango at the Wall, we had a bit of both, which is beautiful. And it's part of the dialogue. But I just want to make that distinction and, and, and that we have to make sure that the fandango es una cosa y el, y el, y el performance es otra, you know? The reality of fandango is a ritual. The reality of fandango is a Mother Earth sacred occurrence is not lost on me. And it's not lost on the people who have ears to hear. What is maybe lost is the idea that performance is ritual as sacred as Mother Earth to people who just put their lives on the line, who put their entire existences on the line to be able to minister to human beings because of their craft. Um, being a musician is <laughs> no joke. Being a performer is no joke. And we lay our lives down in the manner that we've been shown by our foremothers and forefathers to give our lives in service to, maybe it's not the Mexican Fandango, but it's the global Fandango. The idea that we bring ourselves, place ourselves on the altar so that the world can see the ritual in, made manifest in our existence. I just wanna say that to use Fandango as, a, as I understand the, the, the ethics of it is one thing, but I think that the practice of it itself is something else. And that's something that I think that as practitioners and as a, a performer on the stage, I think it's really important for us to not conflate the two. Like you started talking about the importance of, of how Fandango democratizes and there's not a, an elitism sort of that happens. And, and you know, and, and I just wanted to bring attention to the fact that, you know, when we talk about performance, there is, there is, of course, there's there's an amazing offering and beauty that goes into that. I honor the people that give their lives to building their skill set and to that live off of this this important work that uh, is being honored very little right now because of the situation that we're in, the COVID situation. But I do think that that it's important for us to make the distinction between the two because otherwise it's sort of it becomes too abstract. And any musician that I know who's just there for the technical mastery of it is a fraud, no matter how technically adept they are. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you for, for that. Um, I think I want to, you know, th there is a question uh, that's coming from the audience asking about the Mexican presence in New York City. I think, I mean, I, I certainly know that there's a very large Mexican community. And, and you know, there is actually a, a group of not just Son Jarocho, because even though we, we could be focused on Son Jarocho, I also love other musical traditions from all over the world. And I could say that, 
you know, in New York alone, there are all of these other musical traditions from Mexico just alone. Um, and so uh, there's a question about that. Have you uh, sensed any of that when you were, I know you now you live in Los Angeles, Arturo, but have you sensed any of I, the Mexican community? I actually don't. I mean, I'm actually back and forth to New York and Los Angeles. Um, I, when I first arrived in New York, I was the only Mexican I knew. Um, but that is no longer the case. And in fact, there's a thriving and powerful Son Jarocho uh, musician and uh, and uh, I think that uh, Mexican presence in New York is really really strong especially where I live which is in Brooklyn and very particular uh, presence of Michoacan a very very profound presence of, of, of it's it you know and in a way it's interesting because it's it it's it's as marginalized as it is anywhere else i mean you know we i've seen uh the chicano art and the murals and it's all miraculous but our presence in uh the united states is still somewhat uh marginalized so but it's good to see in new york that the food has gotten better jorge if you could uh talk about this very special quality that um, this musical tradition, in particular the Fandango, has as community building, because it appears to me, at least from that very first experience that you had, when you went and you never didn't know how to play harana, you didn't know how to sing, and yet you felt welcomed. You felt like you could be part of this community, and then soon enough, you even had the brilliant idea to create this you know, with, with other friends, the Fandango Fronterizo. Tell us about that particular aspect, the, the, the community building aspect. Correct. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Son Jarocho and fan, the, the celebration of the Fandango, the ritual of the Fandango, has that uh, community building energy that I never felt anywhere else in any other genre that I play. I played before... Uh, classical music, uh, South American music, music from Central America, other music from Mexico. But I, it never happened to me that I was so welcome into, an air, uh, into a celebration the way I was welcome to a fandango. And after the, all these years that I've been playing fandangos, I, I've been lucky enough to be in Santana, in New York, in Los Angeles and San Francisco, and, and I went to France one time, and I was in, in Paris by the Eiffel Tower during a Fandango. I was in Veracruz many times, and it's amazing the way you're welcome every single place you go to a Fandango. Is this energy that is built around it, that it's so beautiful and so um, inviting and welcoming. And to me, that was one of the things that make me more happier than ever when I was approached by Arturo with the idea of bringing jazz together with Son Jarocho. Uh, being a, 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 an educated music, musician, um, I had the entire uh, belief that uh, jazz is one of the richest music that we can find in the world. And... and uh, and Son Jarocho to me means so much. So putting those two together, it was like a dream come true. Even though I never dreamed, dreamed that, that situation, it was so beautiful to bring in those two together. And, you know, putting this uh, in, in perspective was amazing for me. It was uh, something that uh, made me feel very, very happy. And um, also this music uh, not only... Uh, well, it brings people together. The Fandangos bring people together. But uh, even in these times, even in these times when we are so sad because we just canceled our Fandango Fronterizo for this year, which was going to be next weekend, uh, it's amazing that we're still together and we're even more together than before because we're all connecting to each other through this pandemic and we're talking to each other right now. We're here in this conference, but I know a lot of people are reaching out to us through this, but a, a lot of people are connecting and 
is showing the kind of family that we have in this music in with this world of the fandango it's it's amazing uh, i mean I, i i feel so blessed for this i think that same sense of community and ritual is experienced when you go to Guantanamo and then sing Changui. That same sense of community and ritual is experienced by people in Brazil, in Candomblé, the people of, uh, you know, and it's, it's in some ways much about uh, the the idea that you had to learn these techniques, that you had to learn the harana and the songs and the actual performance practice was your entry point in some ways. So actually respecting the tradition of what it goes into making music is as much a part of the ritual as the ritual itself. Um, one doesn't step into uh wawanko and clap on the wrong clave uh so this idea of knowing the technical aspects of performance is truly important the difference is that it, when the performance practice becomes more important than the message when the performance practice becomes more important than why one performs That's a real that's a real issue. So I think uh, uh, it, you know I've gotten that feeling sitting and jamming with my friends at the age of twelve in some high school uh, practice room. I've gotten that feeling sitting next to Maestro uh, Jorge and learning about uh, Haranas. I've gotten that feeling from playing in a trio setting at four o'clock in the morning in. Uh, in some bar in Brooklyn. So the idea that music transcends uh, humanity, human foibles, even disagreements, I think is central to all of this. Uh, Marta, talk about, uh, and, and then maybe we could also go back around, just we have about five minutes left. Um, improvisation. Son Jarocho, and I've always believed this for, for a couple of decades now because I've traveled the world and I've seen other musical styles from Brazil, from Cuba, even some European traditions. Um, there is an improvisation quality in Son Jarocho, just like there is in jazz. How do you see that intersection in your case with the music that you make? How does improvisation come about? Well, the music that we make it compose is, of course, for the stage. And that's, that's, it's a set, and perhaps there are improvisational aspects within the actual form, but for the most part, it's set, verdad? But in terms of the fandango and how improvisation happens, you know, a song can last 20, 30 an hour if it sounds good and everybody's feeling it until somebody says, una, then the song does not end, right? And the improvisation goes because everybody's um, dialoguing, people are going back and forth, the canto, the rhythm feels good, the bailadoras are on point, you know, the rhythm, I'm, you know, those things can go on and on and on and on. Um, uh, and uh, I would say that when you're first learning and you're learning in Fandango, you're really trying to get the basics, you're trying to keep up with other folks. There is definitely a hierarchy in the sense that in the middle of the tarima, Um, you know, in the semicircle or the full circle, the most experienced are closer to the tarima. And as you move out, you know, um, the least experienced, uh, you usually know that you should stand behind somebody you want to learn from or things of that sort. And so you're sort of respecting the, the, the shape of the fandango, so to speak. And as you're listening, you know, you really don't, with the exception of knowing as many versos as you can memorize, and even if you don't knowing, know them, know how to respond. If somebody calls a verso, you know how to respond in, in tandem, right? Uh, making sure that you understood what they said and that you're calling, calling the verso back. And then as it's, as, as, uh, once you get good at that, there are some folks like Patricio Hidalgo who can basically improvise. It takes improvisation to a whole other level because he can improvise in the moment what he sees, what he's breathing, what he's feeling, the musicians that are inspiring him, the color of that man's hat. Like, you know, he's taking all of these things and synthesizing it through his lifelong experience in the fandango, in the culture itself, in the, the, the language that they use, right? And he 
create these amazing decimas or write an amazing cuarteta or quinteta right in that moment, right, of the song. And so improvisation, there is no song jarocho, there is no fandango, uh, there is no song jarocho without the fandango, and there is no song jarocho without improvisation in every moment, you know. I totally agree with Marta on that, and I would like to add only that um, the the beauty of this music and the fandango is that nobody knows what verses we're going to sing. Nobody knows who's going to dance, when. So all of that is improvised on the spot. Who's going to sing, when is it going to end. We know that, that the Siki City is the first song, but nobody knows which one is going to be the last one or who's going to sing last. So all that is free. Even though you sing verses that, that everybody knows, there's no order, right? The order is totally open. And so it's the improvisation feeling. Who's going to dance after me or after Marta? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. It's a, it's a, it's a secret. It, it happens when it happens. Right. And there's a, but there is, it sounds like it's a free for all, right? But as I said earlier, it's really not. It's really, there's a protocol to how it, of course, how you of come course, in of and course. off it, right? There's a way in which, of course, of right, course. right. And so yeah. it's, um, and sometimes in the midst of it, very kindly or sometimes not too kindly, they'll say, like, hey, to, sigo yo, or, or todavía no, or, you know, like they'll either pinch you off the tarima or there. It's always, it's always with love, but there is an element of like people get corrected, you know here and there and said, you know, hey, you know, hang on, you know, it's, I'm still up right now. You have to wait for the, the estribillo or, you know, a little bit after the estribillo or, you know, so there's a whole, um, and that's what you learn for, right? That's why you, you, you develop your skill set in order to be a better participant, a more present um, um, sort of uh, uh, convivial uh, um, being in the process. Arturo, as a jazz musician, I mean, we all know that in order to be a jazz musician, you have to know how to improvise. How was it for you to encounter this wonderful aspect of Son Jarocho, of improvisation, and realize that, wow, I can work with this? The tradition of Trova, the tradition of Trovador, is found throughout Latin America. It's a p part of Puerto Rico and Cuba and... Uh, the tradition of the uh, improvising decima is something that you'll find throughout the America. So it's not just Veracruz, it's not just Sonar Ocho. The idea of improvisation being a, a part of humanity, I think, is universal. Jazz musicians happen to do something that was taught to us by our African DNA, the rhythm code that really comes from the way people communicate in Africa, and that is why I call it response, uh, extended. And yes, at the end of the day, aptly so, the idea of improvisation is really the idea of manners, the idea of good, polite behavior, knowing what to do when and how to do it, because you respect the people that you're interacting with. A jazz musician is part of the listening group of human beings as much he is or she a player in a situation so the truth of the matter is that the practice of improvisation for a jazz musician is very much like it is for trovadores throughout the world listen and you will learn thank you i want to give we basically are out of time and um, i want to give each one sort of any final comments you'd like to make uh, as we conclude uh, the the conversation tonight. Marta. I first want to say I, I'm very grateful to be a part of this conversation. Hopefully we can keep talking about this. I think um, even in Fandango, which is the root of what we're talking about here and at, and at the border, there's fissures, right? There are ruptures that happen. And uh, the dialogue, I think, is very much, um, um, and I took this dialogue as part of that, um, I think that the project itself is, is, is it was really uh, wonderful to watch at, at the border. It was gorgeous. And so I just want to say that much. But I also want to say that, that the community that brings together this work um, is, is, of course, um, Jorge Castillo is, 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 is at the forefront, absolutely. And there were a lot of other community members, as he mentioned earlier as well, 
people like, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, then we saw in the video, Roxana Bernal, Adrián, este, um, uh, Carolina Martinez, uh, you know, all, all of these folks that have come together and, and folks from also Los Angeles who, um, who have, who uh, raised money, uh, other in past um, experiences for the Fandango Fronterizo to raise money. So I'm just going to say this much that the Fandango is, is vast. It's all over the U.S. from upstate Washington, uh, Canada. You have the Midwest, New York, as as Arturo had mentioned earlier, and and um, I think that the spirit um, right now of the Fandang was one such that um, even though we can't get together right now due to uh, um, um, COVID nineteen, we're trying to. Um, I think that the we're gonna. It's like riding a bicycle. We're gonna start where we left off. Right. Um, I want uh, Jorge to, to go next because then I want to conclude them with, with, uh, with Arturo and then we're going to end with a piece from Arturo. Okay, well, um, again, uh, like, like uh, Martha said, thank you so much to Dan and all the people that organized this. Thanks, Beto, for, for coordinating this, for being so helpful with all these calls and uh, being so professional. Arturo and Marta, great to be here with you. And I, again, um, I think this music is wonderful. We can wait to have another Fandango. I think mean, we want to get out of our houses to play more music together. Um, I, it's amazing that I remember the last Fandango we had here in Tijuana was in February. And uh, it's been a, three months almost since we had a Fandango. But uh, other than that, I want to thank everybody. I think uh, Marta just said it. I was going to say it too. Uh, there's been a lot of people that has worked on this, uh, and I want to thank them. And I don't want to say any names because I know I'm going to forget somebody, and I don't want to offend anybody. But there's so, so many people in Tijuana, in San Diego, in Santa Ana. They always help us. I mean, this Vandango belongs to everybody. We just put our work on this. But it's amazing. I mean, we also want to thank Aldo Flores, who is a, a great guy in in um, Tabasco and San Andres, uh, San Andres Tuxtla. He, I, I don't know if you guys know this, but um, oh, Beto, I don't know if you know this, but uh, in in um, there's uh, about twenty fandangos all over the world that get organized to every year at the same time that the fandango fronterizo, and it keeps growing. From France, Switzerland, Canada, New York, L.A., Washington, whatever. I mean, there's so many of those that keep growing. And it, it and, and this Fandango, not the Fandango from Teresa, the celebration of the Fandango bring, keeps bringing people together. And and that's what it's, I think we, we, we're we so happy to be part of this. And, and thank you for inviting us again to this. And let's, let's hope we can do a Fandango pretty soon. In New York, uh, of course, Arturo. <laughs> Arturo, um, any final comments? And then I'm going to ask you one more thing. Sure. I, um, I think that there's a bigger issue in our lives than uh, Son Jarocho or uh, Fandango. And that is the predilection for human beings to feel that what they are who they are is somehow superior to others. I think we see that in the rhetoric that uh, America first and all this uh, isolationism that is practiced. Uh, uh, France and Paris think they're the greatest cities. So does uh, Tehran and the music in, uh, in Latvia. The Latvians think is sacred and ritual and the best. I just want to say from the bottom of my heart that my music is not the best. My music and my love is not the best. It's part of a continuum that we all belong to, every single human being. And until we see our global reality and see ourselves as connected, as the music of Fandango and Son Harocho come from other places, maybe as far back as India, we don't know, we don't care. What we do know is that this journey really connects every human being from every position and every place of power or lack thereof. 
And so if you're a human being and you love being human, you'll realize your interconnectedness to one another. And that's truly the lesson not only of Jorge Francisco Castillo, but of music itself. Thank you so much, Arturo. I would like you to just say briefly a little bit about this piece we're going to go out with. It's called El Maquech. It's a folk song from the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, from the Jarana. Not to confuse, okay, it's a different Jarana. A Jarana over there means an orchestra, a gathering of brass musicians that play not the Jarana, but another musical tradition. El Maquech is also the name of an insect that I guess was on the verge of extinction some years ago, but now it's okay. Tell us about this composition that you that your son wrote, Adam O'Farril, and then you rearranged now, and it's included actually in the in the album Fandango at the Wall. This is not a composition of, of my son's. It's an adaptation, an adaptation of a Yucatan folk song, and I I'm so glad we get to share it today because um this pandemic has been a lot of things we've seen a lot of a lot of really crazy uh things happen people lose their livelihoods we've seen uh checks that never come we've seen people uh, whine about going to the beach when other people are dying we've seen things that are beyond uh, the scope of human recognition but i think it's precisely in those settings that one discovers oneself, that one discovers the true meaning of wealth is embracing one another. And to this moment, I can't believe that I had the privilege of spending two months with my son. And I feel like this is so much not about Yucatan or Makesh or America or the United States. It's about reintroduction. And so what you're going to hear is love in the guise of a Yucatan folk song, or better yet, a trumpet, a piano, a son and a father reintroduced through circumstances. <laughs> 